support carers. My Lords, as all of us have commented, we really appreciate this debate initiated by Baroness Gale. We get to voice our concerns. Indeed, one way of framing our commitment to improving young women's status is to help them to find their voice, to give them the skills and space to be heard. It's why campaigners complain about mansplaining or worry about young girls being bullied off social media by sexist trolls. But I want to talk about two categories of young women whose voices we seem happy to have muted because their stories offend contemporary political orthodoxies. Some women's voices are definitely more equal than others. The demand to listen to women arguably reached its zenith with the Me Too movement, even leading to the slogan, Believe All Women. This slogan sometimes dangerously dispensed with important principles, such as innocent until proven guilty. And those who spoke out were often encouraged to elide serious sexual abuse with more trivial, if unpleasant, incidents of interpersonal advances. Regardless, at the height of Me Too, while Westminster and the media raged about predatory abuses of power with acres of coverage telling uh, those victims stories, the same politicians and commentariat ignored another group of young women at the heart of industrial-scale sexual abuse by grooming gangs operating across myriad northern towns such as Rotherham, Oldham and Blackpool. This week, the Telford Inquiry revealed details of the horrendous catalogue of rapes and sexual, sexual degradation of thousands of young women over decades. When these largely white working class girls turned to the authorities for help, schools, social services, councils, police officers dismissed their complaints, looked the other way, even victim blamed. One survivor, Joanne Phillips, described how they were dismissed as child prostitutes. When one young woman went to Telford Police about Sabir Ahmed abusing her, her complaints were ignored. Grotesquely, Ahmed went on to work for Oldham Council as a welfare officer, simultaneously leading an Oldham grooming gang, now convicted of rape and sexual trafficking, but crimes which could have been prevented if his original female accuser had not been contemptuously disregarded. More shamefully, despite inquiries, court cases and mealy-mouthed police and council mayor culpers, polite society continues to sideline these young women's stories. Isn't it shocking that despite these revelations, there's not a clamour for urgent questions and emergency statements about the issue here in Parliament? And where are those social justice activists taking to the streets, chanting the name of 16-year-old pregnant Lucy Howe, who died alongside her sister and mother in a house fire started by her abuser, Azhar Ali Mahmood. Is this awkward silence due to political expediency? We know the reason these horrendous incidents happened in plain sight was that those in authority feared that investigating the Asian male perpetrators could inflame racial and religious tensions. Council employees who tried to whistleblow with rare courageous exceptions were silenced themselves by threats they'd be labelled as bigots. And indeed, that message, you can't say that for fear of being branded a hate-mongering bigot, is silencing another group of young women who, ironically, simply want to discuss womanhood. In recent months, we've heard of the 18-year-old who was bullied out of school by her fellow pupils who accused her of transphobia, and she was abandoned by her teachers for fear of guilt by association. And her crime was using her voice to challenge a baroness speaking at the school when she quoted a debate in this very chamber about the attempt to pass maternity legislation minus the word mother or woman. While we all know about Professor Kathleen Stock, meanwhile, we are less, who was hounded out of Sussex University, where less attention is given to those female students I've met who confessed they were too scared to speak in support of Professor Stock in case of reprisals by activist tutors or having their academic prospects destroyed if dubbed a bigot. Such censorious intolerance of views that clash with identity politics has real-life victims. Today, law student Lisa Kyo should be attending her graduation at Abertay University. But after a two-month misconduct investigation for having the temerity to say women have vaginas in a gender and feminism seminar, she's been ostracised by fellow students despite being cleared. Congratulations, Lisa, you should be there. No wonder the lessons of these and many, many other examples I could give means that young women in 2022 believe they should stay stum and self-censor in order to be, avoid being branded a bigot.
The old sexist dictum, be seen, not heard, is back with a modern twist. To conclude, here in this chamber, we must not simply proclaim our commitment to giving young women a voice. We must instead mount a vigorous defence of free speech, the freedom to voice dissenting, even unfashionable opinions. And we owe it to the victims of grooming scandals to learn a bitter lesson. If we enable a culture that chills speak, beat speech in case it offends, <coughs> or leads to demonising labels, it can lead to catastrophic, tragic results for women. So my Lords, this has been a fascinating and mixed debate.